Welcome, everyone. My name is Suzanne Stanis. I'm the Director of Heritage Education for Indiana Landmarks, and I'm also a member of the Preserving Historic Places Conference Planning Committee. We're glad you could join us for our virtual conference session. We've hosted some great programs, and we invite you to view all of them on the Preserving Historic Places Conference website. I want to recognize my co-administrators of the conference, Jeannie Regan-Dinius with the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, Jessica Kramer of Indiana Landmarks, and Liz Monroe of Indiana University. The conference and these virtual sessions would not be possible without the generous financial support of our partners, Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, Indiana Landmarks, Indiana University, and the St. Joseph County Commissioners and the sponsors who help us keep our conference registration fee affordable and provide scholarships. They include RC Engineers, the City of South Bend, Cornelius O'Brien Lecture Series, Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, Marvin Windows, National Park Service, West Chaney Elsner Associates, and Visit South Bend Mishawaka. Additional support is provided by Berglin, Cultural Resource Analyst, Historic Preservation and Heritage Consulting, the Indiana Archaeology Council, Keyser Consulting, Old National Bank, Ratio Architects, and Ari Diamond and Associates. Thank you so much for your contributions. And please save Thursday, February 25th for our next virtual session. Dr. Brooke Drew of Indiana State University discusses her fascinating work to identify unmarked graves in Indianapolis's Bethel Cemetery. Now some quick housekeeping. We're using the webinar version of Zoom, so please submit your questions using the Q&A feature. I'll be moderating and asking the questions as time allows. We'll take most of them at the end. This session is being recorded and will be available shortly after the presentation. And the program also qualifies for continuing education credits for members of the American Institute of Architects. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Bile, a professional engineer with RC Engineers. At RC, Emily works to investigate and repair building envelopes and analyze and design wood, concrete, and steel structures. Emily is a structural engineer by trade, but her passion lies in preserving historic buildings. She says it's been a great honor to help restore bottle works, and she looks forward to sharing her experiences with you today. Emily has also had the pleasure of working on four of Indiana's historic county courthouses, including a facade restoration of the famous tree-topped Decatur County Courthouse and stabilization of the clock tower on the Washington County Courthouse, which I'm happy to say moved it from Indiana Landmark's 10 most endangered list to the safe category. So thanks for joining us today, Emily, and thank you again for all you do to preserve historic places. Thank you, Suzanne. Welcome everyone. My name is Emily Bile, and I am a professional engineer with RC Engineers. As Suzanne mentioned, we are a local structural engineering firm out of Fishers, Indiana. We do structural design for new buildings as well as existing buildings and facade assessments. At Bottleworks, we were hired by the developer who is Hendrix Commercial Properties to design and oversee the repairs for the exterior of the existing Coca-Cola plant buildings. This included the terracotta, the granite, brick, limestone, but today I'll be talking to you specifically about the terracotta restoration. So before we begin, I always think it's important to see where we started. And so this is the site when we came on site in 2015. And we'll talk a little bit about where this site was and who was using it at that time. And then we will move on and talk about the terracotta restoration. For your information, today's presentation has been accredited by AIA for one hour of continuing education. So today's learning objectives are to discuss the history of the Bottle Works District to talk about architectural terracotta and why it was used on buildings. We'll talk about common failures we see in terracotta facades and also the repair methods and replace it, replacement materials that were used to restore and recreate this terracotta.
So to get started, here's some really cool photos back from the 1930s, which feature the fountain up on top of the building up here. And then also you can see all the Coca-Cola delivery trucks. The original plant was just this portion of the building. And then there was a garage across the street. So in 1930, the first portion of the bottling plant was built. And here's that garage right across the street. And today this is on Massachusetts Avenue, just inside the North Split where I-70 and I-65 converge. The beautiful front facade of all this really intricate terracotta is on Massachusetts Avenue. So when I talk about the Mass Ave elevation, that's what I'm talking about. And then the, the major thoroughfare now of the Bottle Works District is Carrollton Avenue. On this diagram, the red represents terracotta facade and the remaining black lines are the brick facades. So we'll be talking primarily about the terracotta. This building was designed by Rubish and Hunter, and that was a very accomplished Indianapolis architectural firm. They also designed Her uh, Hilbert Circle Theater, the Circle Tower, the Columbia Club, the Indiana Theater, most known as the IRT, just to name a few. The terracotta was manufactured by the Indianapolis Terracotta Company, which was a subsidiary of the American Terracotta Corporation near Chicago. The Mass Ave elevation features this really cool terracotta and perhaps the most iconic part of that terracotta are these fountains. And so you think Coca-Cola, the soda fountain, they actually worked a fountain into the design. And there's also the sunburst pattern back behind it. And so that's featured throughout the building, not just on the Mass Ave elevation, to sort of have that fountain be part of that Coca-Cola design. And so here we look down Carrollton today, and we have these tall areas, which we call the pylons. And this pylon here is the break from the first portion of construction and then on to the next periods. The second phase of construction was in the late 1930s and early 1940s. They added another addition, they added an addition on the bottling plant and a second garage across the street. In 1939, Philip Weisenberg took over the Rubish and Hunter firm when Preston Rubish and Edgar Hunter retired. And so Philip Weisenberg was the one that designed all of the successive additions for the plant. The third phase was in the 1940s and 50s. They added a very large addition at the back of the building and a third garage. And then later they added garages four and five, which have since been demolished. At this time period, the Indianapolis plant was actually the largest Coca-Cola bottling plant in the world. The Indy Star actually reported that they had approximately 260 workers and they were producing 2.25 million bottles of Coke a week. Very cool. This plant continued to do well in business until cans took over bottles in the 1960s. So here we have an aerial view from 1956. You can see the interstate hasn't come through here yet. And all the housing is really just backed right up to the back of the garages. It's likely that Carrollton was a city street at that time. In the late 1960s, Coca-Cola decided to build a new bottling plant in Speedway, likely to convert from bottling to canning. And they actually sold this property to Tony Holman, who many of you know as the former owner of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and also as a namesake for Rose Holman Institute. 
it was reported that he stored his car collection here for just a few years until he sold the property to the Indianapolis Public Schools in 1972. In 1972, IPS started using this property as their bus depot and service center, and that lasted all the way until 2017. So for that 45 years, there were the buses lined up behind the garages. And so in this 1986 aerial view, you can see I-70 running through here now. By 2017, Hendricks Commercial Properties, the owner and developer of the Bottle Works District, began repurposing the site. And so this is a, an aerial showing IPS had moved out. Two years later, lots of activity as construction got underway. So today, you can go to the Bottle Works District website and find the directory and find all the cool things that you can go down and check out at, at the Bottle Works District. The largest development is the new Bottle Works Hotel that went into the bottling plant on the second floor and also a newly added third floor. On the first floor, there's retail and salons and other cool shops. Across the street, There'll be the Pins Mechanical Company, which is a bowling alley with uh, pinball machines, and other fun things to do. They will be opening this spring. And then there's also Living Room Theaters, which is a movie theater here that's already open. And the, the hotel is already open as well. Also, garages two and three, they added an atrium over the alleyway punched some overhead doors through the alley walls. And this is now one building called the Garage Food Hall. So you can go and check out all these really cool restaurants in the food hall. And that is now open. Also, if you're wondering how Coca-Cola feels about all this and the fact that their trademark is on the side of the buildings, You'll be happy to know that Hendrix actually got their blessing and they were very pleased that the buildings were being used and did not have any problems with the Coca-Cola logo, logo still being on the side of the building. Before we get into the restoration of terracotta, I wanted to talk a little bit about what terracotta is. So the words terracotta literally mean baked earth or cooked earth in Latin. And terracotta has been used for thousands of years. Think ancient Rome, ancient Greece, and as you see here, ancient China, where you have heard, probably heard of the terracotta warriors. Today, we see them, see terracotta used for flower pots and drain tiles, clay tile roofs, and it's very similar to your coffee cup. Terracotta, ceramic, and porcelain are all different, but they are very similar. And the difference is the temperature at which they are fired. So your coffee cup, being ceramic most likely, is hired at a, a higher temperature. Porcelain is fired at an even higher temperature than that. So terracotta is at the lowest temperature. However, low is relative because it's fired at over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Terracotta can be glazed or unglazed. And so when it's glazed, it's very similar to your coffee cup. There's a clay body with a glaze on the outside of it. When it's used to cloud a building, it's referred to as architectural terracotta. It rose in popularity in the 1870s and it was used to the middle of the 1900s. By the late 1800s, it was used as an economical alternative to carved stone. And the reason for that was because carved stone, you have to actually carve every piece of the stone for all over the whole building. With terracotta, you could use a mold to create incredibly intricate detail that would be consistent across the whole building. 
It was also good for fireproofing. So it was used inside of skyscrapers in Chicago as column wraps to protect the steel columns from fire. There's also much more opportunity for artistic expression using terracotta with the ability to leave it unglazed or to glaze it. There are a lot of colors that could be used and finishes that could be used, could be glazed in vibrant colors, and it could also have incredibly intricate and ornate details. All of these photos are from Indianapolis. We have, of course, the Indiana Theater, now known by most as the IRT. This is the King Cole Building, originally called the Khan Building, which features these really cool lions, although you'll have a hard time seeing them because the lions are actually up on the 10th floor level. We also have the Mira Temple, has some really cool colored terracotta glazed down here at the bottom. The Mira Temple, now known as the Old National Center. And then there's also the Lombard Building and the Victoria Center on Washington Street, which shows two buildings next to each other, one that's glazed and one that's not. Another advantage of terracotta is that it's actually lighter than stone. So when you look at the wall, it looks like very big, beefy, solid, heavy pieces. But when you take a piece off, like this ornate piece here, you can see it's only four to six inches thick. And when you look at the back side, it's hollow. There's cells here that are separated by what we call webs that help stiffen the piece. So here's a piece that fell out of one of the garages where you can see those webs and the cells and another here at this coping piece. Lastly, terracotta became popular during this time period because it was easy to clean, much like your coffee cup. In this time period, there was, the cities were filled with soot and smoke and the glazing helped keep the buildings clean, even just from simple rainwater. As you can imagine, trying to build with blocks that are hollow presents an interesting challenge. It can be built with most types of backup walls, such as brick or concrete or steel. Here on the left, you can see what it looks like when it's built monolithically with brick, where they actually build the brick into the cells of the terracotta. Then they also add anchors, strap anchors and other anchors to hold the pieces into the wall. It can also be built as a veneer where it's just a covering for the structural backup system. Here, this is a reinforced concrete backup wall. And you can see the in the late 1800s, they came up with some really clever ways to attach a veneer system to a solid backup wall. So you can see slots with anchors, pencil rods, and steel angles that all help hold this on here. And it could also be attached to a steel frame building. When you're looking to restore terracotta, one of the first things that must be identified is what type of backup it has, because the wall acts much differently based on whether it was built monolithically or as a veneer. And so in order to identify the problems correctly, that's one of the first things that has to be determined. The garages at Bottle Works are built with brick backup and they also have some steel. So this is a combined condition where it's built monolithically, but also with some steel added. So you can see that the manufacturers were very clever. At that time, what they would do for window headers often was create a slot in the back of the piece to fit onto a steel angle higher in the wall, rather than putting the steel angle right above the window so that you could see the steel angle. So this way, when it's up higher and slotted on there, all you see is the beautiful terracotta when you look up at the windows. 
Here's another example of this on the Mass Ave elevation. You can see where pieces were removed during restoration. You can take a peek up here and see this fit right onto that steel angle. On the bottling plant, the terracotta is tied as a veneer to a solid concrete backup wall. So sneaking up on the roof, if you look behind one of these pylons, you can see the concrete backup wall. And looking closer, you can see how this concrete wall was built with the veneer right on the front of it. So this is what veneer construction looks like. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the manufacturing process for terracotta. I think it's really interesting and it's also very valuable information when you have to then restore it. So these photos are provided from a book called Common Clay, which tells the history of the American Terracotta Corporation from 1881 to 1966. To create terracotta, they would actually first have to sculpt the model piece, the prototype, and that piece is what they would replicate using terracotta. So when they started making a piece, it would start out in what was called the model shop, where the modelers, who are the sculptors, would literally sculpt the very first piece that would then be duplicated. They used an exaggerated ruler, so it wasn't true to scale, it's actually enlarged, and this was called a shrinkage scale. So they would build the pieces oversized on purpose, so that when it was fired in the kiln, it would shrink and it would be the right size. And so you can see here that ruler called the shrinkage scale. After the initial model was created, that model would head to the plaster shop. The plaster shop is where they would create a plaster mold, much like when the dentist takes impressions of your teeth to fit you for a retainer or some other implement. And they create a mold that has five pieces. There's the, the face piece and then four sides. And that way, when it's in pieces like that, it's much easier to strip the mold off later. So once the mold was created, that would head to the pressing room. Here's the pressing room. You can see some of these molds where the hand pressers would press clay by hand into those molds. And the molds were made with metal straps around the outside to hold them together until it was ready to strip off the mold. A single mold could be used to make between 20 and 80 pieces, depending on the amount of ornamentation on the piece. And once the mold is removed, the piece was modified as needed to add slots and holes and things to help with the anchorage when it was fit into the wall. And so that's what this gentleman is doing here. Then it was onto the drying room where the clay was dried for one to two days at about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And then onto the spraying department. This is where they would apply the glaze. This by itself is a, a whole nother talk. They had a chief chemist and he was responsible for developing the glaze, the chemistry for the glaze and the different colors and textures and all of those things for the glaze. Then onto the kiln department. The terracotta was fired in a kiln in either a large round kiln like this, that was called a periodic kiln. Here's a number of them out in their yard or in a tunnel kiln such as this. And to give you some perspective, the periodic kilns could hold 10 to 60 tons of terracotta at one time, and the tunnel kiln could fit 62 of these kiln cars in it at one time. Once the pieces came out of the kiln, 
they would go to the fitting room for the final adjustments to make sure all the sizes were just right when they laid it up in the wall. This was very important because most terracotta systems are designed to have quarter inch wide mortar joints. So there's very, very little room for error. Finally, the pieces were packaged and shipped to the site. When RC was asked to work on the restoration of the terracotta, the first thing that we did was try to track down as many of the original drawings as possible. We had some success with this and we were able to find not only the original architectural drawings, but also a number of the original terracotta shop drawings by the American Terracotta Company. And so here's what the Mass Ave elevation detail looks like where Rubish and Hunter drew what they envisioned for all of this ornamentation. Here's the original 1930 bottling plant, and then also the garage across the street. And so this is really helpful to us as we try to identify the damage and understand how it was put together, but also for me, it's just really cool. I think it's really neat to see these old drawings and to see uh, what they look like compared with how it really came together. Now we'll talk about common failures in terracotta. The most prevalent failure mechanism at bottle works was glaze spalling. So that's this orange stuff that you're seeing here which in our office we call chicken pox. So you can see there's quite a bit of problem with that at Bottle Works. That's not necessarily typical, but it is something that we encountered at Bottle Works quite prevalent, uh, to be quite prevalent. And uh, so we'll talk about some of the different types of damage that we saw. So the glaze spalls that I just mentioned are these orange spots much like a, a chip in your coffee cup when you lose part of the glaze. You can also see in this photo and in this photo, these fine hairline cracks. Now that's called crazing. And that is hairline cracks that have occurred in the glaze. And what's happening there is the, that thermal expansion causes the clay body to grow the, the inside part, the clay inside the terracotta to grow. And if it grows more than what the glaze can handle, then it will start to craze and crack. And so crazing has to do with compatibility between the clay mixture and the glaze mixture. Generally, these are hairline cracks, so they don't cause a problem. It's similar to if you hard boil an egg and then start just cracking the shell. It's very tight hairline cracks. However, if there is a defect that allows water to get in behind the glaze, then when it freezes, it can start popping off the glaze. And that's what you see here. And as additional water gets in in other areas nearby, you can start to see this bubbling effect where the glaze has come loose. In this photo, you can see one of these areas where it has popped off and there's a loose area here. When you look behind it, you can see that it's actually trapping bacteria and other organics, which lead to even more glaze falling. As I mentioned, Bottle Works had more issues with glaze falling than we might typically see. But the thing is that there was not so much glaze spalling in some areas of the building as there were in others. So this is the 1941 portion, the second portion of the bottling plant. And this is the third portion of the bottling plant. You'll notice there's, there's a crack here, but there's not really any glaze spalling. And then here, got a serious case of chicken pox. <laughs> so, it, it, it seems like there was likely an issue with the compatibility between the clay and the glaze for this run. And 
particularly these fluted pieces with the, the rounded face, those in particular had a lot of glaze falling. So it's possible that as they run through the kiln, maybe they didn't get something quite right there. It's also a number of deep spalls. These are some of the ugliest photos, of course. There were a number of pieces that just had corners chipped off, but if water collects in these cells, it can expand uh, when it freezes and start cracking whole uh, fronts of pieces off. It's also a lot of cracking. Generally, the cracking is caused by either corroding steel in the backup system or by thermal expansion and contraction of the masonry along the length of the wall. So the cracking here is from the steel angle that we saw earlier. When water gets into the wall, it corrodes that steel angle, causing it to expand, and that telegraphs a crack out to the front face of the piece. Here's a close-up of that cracking. And over here, this is from thermal expansion. As this wall heats up on a hot day in the summer, it grows just a little bit, but it's just enough to cause some serious cracking as it pushes on this pilaster. Luckily, the Mass Ave elevation with all of its beautiful detailing overall was in pretty good condition. Uh, the only thing really we saw here was some cracking in these pilasters that were in between the windows. There are also a number of areas where the terracotta was bulging or displacing. You can't see it from far away, but when you get in a little bit closer here, you can see that it was bulging by inches. And at the pylons, you can't see it right away, but when you look at a different angle, you can see that they're actually bulging outward in the middle. So if you look at this joint, it's not a nice, clean, crisp line all the way across. You can see it starting to come up at an angle because this is starting to bulge out. So then when you look at the previous angle, you start to notice there's some gaps in the joints here. And that is because the steel angles back here holding up all this masonry are corroding. They're actually jacking all of this masonry up. And so there's a crack forming right across here. There are also a number of previous patches throughout the building. Here at this pylon, we had a similar uh, displacement issue, and a number of the pylons had this, these displacement issues. Here you can see that the displacement was bad enough that that crack ripped right across here and actually busted all these pieces at one time. And sometime during the life of this building, someone came in and tried to restore it, and obviously those have not lasted. And of course, the building has not been cleaned in a very long time. There are a number of ferrous stains from steel throughout the building, but I personally think that the school bus exit sign takes the cake for that one. The skyward facing surfaces were also very heavily stained with what was likely soot. And it really gets into the crazing and makes it stand out. And then, of course, there are the fun tidbits that you never expected, and they tell the story of the whole building over its life. As we walked along in front of the garages, we would see one garage door opening, and we get to the next one and notice that it's much taller. Well, what happened here was the school buses needed to have a wash bay, so they ended up having to enlarge this opening so that they could fit the school buses in to be washed. And you can see here where they added some pieces to try to mimic the terracotta in a way that was a little bit more pleasing until the paint came off, of course. 
And this is my personal favorite. This was one of the things that as we were working our way down Carrollton, cataloging the damage on the bottling plant, we looked up and did a double take. We realized that coca was missing in this part of the building. There are a number of Coca-Cola logos throughout the building. This is just one of them, but it was something that we didn't notice right away. I'm sure there's an interesting story here, but we don't really know anything about it. What we do know is that it happened long enough ago that it was replaced with terracotta. Given that terracotta production had largely ceased by the mid 1900s, this suggests that this occurred and was replaced while Coca-Cola was still in the building. Once we were able to document the damage, we developed repair drawings to show the contractor how to go about restoring all of these different types of damage. We followed the US Department of Interior's protocols for restoration. And of course, we also tried to bring about the owner's vision for these buildings. Now as Hendricks Commercial Properties. They are the owner and developer, and they set us on a course to try to restore as much of the original material in place as possible. They told us that they love the history of this building and the stories that it tells. And being history lovers ourselves, we really enjoyed working with them and their appreciation for the terracotta rather than trying to replace it. Our masonry subcontractor was Brody Campbell, a local masonry restoration company. The first task before repairing anything was to give the whole building a much needed cleaning. Brody's crews scrubbed every inch of these buildings to get them ready for repairs. So the next thing, next time that you think to complain about washing the dishes, think about these guys out there scrubbing every inch of these buildings. It was like watching someone cleaning the teeth of a, a dragon. It was every time we went back to the site, they had just worked their way a little bit further down the building. And they did additional cleaning throughout the repair process and also to finish up at the end. This is my personal favorite before and after of the cleaning operations. They got it all shined up. The next biggest undertaking was the glaze spalls and the deep spall repairs. The majority of these repairs were performed in place. So Brody's crews were all over the building in lifts and ladders and from ground level, repairing every nook and cranny of this building. However, there were also hundreds of pieces that had to be removed and reset properly, particularly at the pylons. And so Brody Campbell was able to set up an indoor repair station. They were still in outdoor temperatures, but they were out of the elements. So to me, this photo was really special because it was very reminiscent of the photos of terracotta being made. And these are crews of true artisans. And I'll show you what I mean as we get into the repairs. The way these deep spalls and glaze spalls are repaired is with a line of repair products that are applied in four different layers. For a deep spall where the profile of the piece is gone, they start with a thick repair material, the first layer, which we colloquially call the thick fill. This material is stiff enough to fill in the deep spalls but it's pliable enough to be sculpted. So here you can see where they're building this beaded detail back into this fluted piece. The next layer is the thin fill. It's a skim coat and it's applied to build the profile back out to match the glaze. So if it's just a glaze spall where the, the clay is still intact, but the glaze is gone, there's a depression because the glaze has a certain thickness to it. So adding this skim coat 
allowed them to build the profile back out so that instead of simply applying a color coat, which would leave a depression, they can build it back out and then make it all nice and smooth and sand it down after it's cured. The next coat is the color coat, which proved to be more tricky than you might think. The photo on the left is from before any repairs. And if you look closely, you can see that there are several different colors of terracotta. These three pieces are more yellowish. Some pieces are a little bit more bluish or pinkish. You also notice that these yellow pieces are the same size and shape of piece, which means they would have been run through the same batch of terracotta through the kiln. And so then the next run of terracotta, maybe this piece, would have a slightly different glaze mix. The chemistry might have been just a little bit, tiny bit different. And it may have been in a different spot in the kiln. It got a little bit different color on it. So in order to match the colors, Brody Campbell actually used a number of different colors to restore the terracotta. They had to try to match it as best they could. The final coat is the clear finish coat. The tricky part here is that the different periods of construction had different gloss levels. So the 1930 construction, the original bottling plant, is very shiny, very glossy. And you look at the 1941 construction, and it has more of a matte finish to it. So not only did Brody have to get the color right, but they also had to change the gloss based on where they were on the building. So here's a before and after of a glazed spall right here in the middle. And it just turned out really wonderfully. The Brody Campbell crews did a great job. Here, this whole corner was missing and they were able to build it back out and even add the edge detail back on. At the garages, this is one of my favorite repairs that they did. You can see this spall here and they were able to repair it in place and even carve all of these details back into it. Very cool. Here's an overall of a, one of the pylons with chicken pox. Up close, you can see how nasty it really was. And here's what it looked like after. Here's another pylon. And again, what it looked like afterwards. I had a lot of fun working with the Brody Campbell crews and seeing them put all, bring all of this to fruition. It was very, very cool. There are also a lot of crack repairs that were needed. So here is the epoxy injection that was done to repair the cracks. The crews install injection ports along the length of the crack, then cover this crack with a removable material so that they can inject epoxy one by one into these ports until the whole crack is full. And then they can remove all of that and finish the piece. So here we have a before and after of some of those crack repairs. And again, those cracks across here and then repaired. So we talked earlier about the displacement at the top of the pylons. We had Brody remove, store, and reset the terracotta above that crack line that we talked about earlier. So all of this came down. And as you can see, they had the pleasure of doing this in the dead of winter last year.
here's after they took all those pieces down. You can see the concrete backup wall. And here's what it looked like when they brought them down and they actually cataloged all of them with Sharpie to number them on the sides of the pieces. And then they had to put it all back like a big jigsaw puzzle. Here you can see the steel that was causing a ruckus in here as it corroded and expanded and shoved all of this masonry up. And you can see how little was left of those angles that were supporting the terracotta. Here they're adding it all back up on the wall again. This was pre-COVID, so the man here with his mask on his chin is not in violation of anything. And they, they added the new steel angles back in and then also added some stainless steel anchors to hold everything in place as they rebuilt it. And so before and after, here you can see those lines that have angles to them, these big gaps. And on this side, nice, clean, crisp lines all across and all those gaps are tightened up. And these holes are here because there were some replacement pieces that they were still waiting on. Speaking of replacement, some of the pieces were beyond repair. We had to make a choice for those replacement materials as to whether we would use true terracotta or a, another replacement material called GFRC. And that stands for glass fiber reinforced concrete. The decision between these two materials often comes down to cost and also lead time. Lead time is the amount of time from when you order it to when it will actually be manufactured and shipped to the site. Oftentimes the GFRC can be more uh, cost effective and have better lead times. And the final product of those two types, they, they both look and mimic terracotta. So even though it's concrete, they can still put the color and the finish and everything to make it look like terracotta. For bottle works, we decided to use true terracotta to replace the pieces that were needed. And the reason was because the cost and the lead times were actually very similar at that particular time period. Today there are only really two or three major manufacturers of architectural terracotta left in the United States and so that's why lead time can really be an issue as those two or three companies are all that's left to make true terracotta. On the Mass Ave elevation, the cracking that I showed you earlier we decided to replace these pieces. And that's because we didn't want to botch them up with trying to do crack repairs. And, for the, and also the cracking was so uh, prevalent that it was just, they were just shattered. And so if you were to try to even epoxy these together, they would have just burst open. So what they did instead was glued them together as best they could and then ship them to the terracotta manufacturer, the supplier. And they were able to use these pieces that had been patched up to create models for the replacement pieces. And so these pieces are all new. And they did a beautiful job matching the new pieces in glaze and also in the, the detail. Here's the before and the after. It's very, very cool. All in all, we're very pleased with how it turned out. We were very thankful for Hendrix giving us the opportunity to work on this iconic building. And it was truly an honor to work with Brody Campbell and their crews to make this a reality. We hope that you'll be able to visit Bottleworks to enjoy and maybe even have a new appreciation for this beautiful terracotta. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box and I'd be happy to answer them. 
Are there questions? I tell you, uh, we'll do our best to get to them, but everybody's got a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> And this is so fascinating. Thank you so much. And I hope you get a chance to go back and see all the positive comments that, that you've received and how excited everybody is about this. Uh, two of the most common, frequently asked questions were, um, what, did, what did they use to clean the original terracotta? And then um, how long will the repairs last? <laughs> Good questions. Uh, the cleaning was a, I can't tell you exactly what we use. It's a proprietary a masonry cleaner, so I can't tell you exactly what it was, but uh, just a common um, masonry restoration uh, cleaning product that is intended for cleaning terracotta. As far as how long the repairs will last, if you recall the discussion about the crazing and the, the way that those balls glaze balls develop. That is something that will be an ongoing process for this building. So the repairs will, the repairs are intended to mimic the original glaze, but you can't, it's, it's not a glaze. It is something intended to mimic it. And so um, it's not something that will last forever. And the owner is aware that this is a this is a maintenance item. It's the same as when you have to replace sealant joints on your building uh, or replace your roof on your house. It's a, it's a maintenance item, so. Yeah, and was this terracotta for Bottle Works originally made at the American Terracotta Company? It was made at the Indianapolis Terracotta Company. Okay, yeah, that was a cool- a subsidiary of the American Terracotta Corporation. Okay. But Indianapolis is, uh, Terracotta Company is actually older than the American Terracotta Corporation up in Chicago area. Okay. And uh, yeah, somebody also asked if, if it was possible to know where the clay came from, because we know we have plenty of clay in Indiana between right. uh, Clay County and then um, right. one person asked about up in Hobart. Uh, any ideas right. where it came from? And that uh, Common Clay book has a lot of information about that. So I encourage people to, to check out that book if they can. Um, the, that book is specifically about the American Terracotta Corporation up in Chicago, but the, I imagine the Indianapolis location used local clay and the Chicago location used local clay there, but they also pulled clay from Indiana. And I, I believe, I remember reading about that uh, they would often get clay from the coal mines because once they pulled the coal out of the earth, the next bed underneath it was clay. Mm. And so it was easy to, and inexpensive for them to sell that clay to the terracotta, terracotta manufacturers. And the, the molds that um, were originally used for terracotta, do you know what those were made out of? Were they wood or? They're plaster. Plas plaster, mm -hmm. okay. So they were, they were molded that way. Um, what about the finish on the lettering for Coca-Cola? Is that gold leaf or? It is not. It is actually uh, the same line of repair materials as what was used for the white. And the, the gold is, as you may have guessed from the photos, the gold is actually part of the terracotta pieces. So there's a shop drawing even that shows the Coca-Cola signature logo and how they broke it into different pieces to create the signature. We had a question on how this project was funded, which I'm sure is a, probably a, a hour long lecture, but I just wanted to put a plug in because um, Hendricks did use the historic preservation tax credit, correct? Yes. And from time to time, you'll see, see appeals from Indiana Landmarks coming out saying, help us support um, and lobby your elected officials for the historic preservation tax credit. So it is a really powerful tool in helping to get some of these big projects started. I don't know, Emily, if you want to add anything else about funding or... You'd have to talk to Hendricks. I don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A compli complicated process. Uh, and I know we've got a lot of professionals that have uh, are participating. And one of them wanted to know how you came up with your estimate for repairs when so much of the damage was probably not visible. 
Um, I know in historic preservation, the word contingency is always uh, <laughs> included in budgets, but thoughts on that? So when we were developing our repair drawings, we did the repairs on a piece by piece basis. So there were some pieces that just had glazed balls and some pieces that just had uh, cracking or something like that. And some pieces had multiple issues. And so when we put together our drawings piece by piece, we said, this piece has glazed balls, this piece has deep balls, et cetera. And then it was priced on a, a unit cost basis per piece. And as far as how to extrapolate how much additional damage there was, we simply gave a percentage. Was, we assume that there's this percent more and they worked that into their costs. Yeah. So historically, did terracotta fall out of favor just you know because of changing styles or was there, was there some other reason? From what I understand, I think part of it had to do with the development of labor unions because, and I, I'm not sure, this is just my, what I surmise. What I was reading was that the, up till the labor unions were formed, the terracotta was actually laid by the manufacturer's crews. So it wasn't shipped to the site and then the contractor put it in, it was shipped to the site and the manufacturer's crews showed up and laid it up. And so when those labor unions were formed, uh, they couldn't do that anymore. The contractor had to be the one to install it. And that caused some issues with lack of training and lack of precision. And so I think there's a lot of costs incurred from that. I also think it's just a, a changing style, you know, like anything, so. Yeah, that's a fascinating look into the history of, of labor. Um, and um, let's see. Oh, and so did Bernie Campbell have trouble finding enough skilled labor for this project since Terracotta is not used that much? Well, I can say they spent a lot of time training their own personnel. They have personnel who had experience in this, but they spent a lot of time training their personnel. I can also say that as a local company, they had most of their crews on this project, uh, if not all, I, I think most of them. And of course, throughout the length of the project, they had different numbers of crews, depending on what work was going on at that time. So as they started out with the cleaning, they would just have one or two crews cleaning. When they got into the heavier lifting, literally, at the pylons, having to take all those pieces down, they needed much more labor. And the the uh, the repairs to the terracotta, the glaze balls and the uh, deep balls, those require a lot of artisan talent, uh, very specific to those repairs. But the other things like tuck pointing and removing pieces and setting them again, that's typical masonry work. So it's not all those very fine craft skills. Um, I mean, they're fine craft masons for mm -hmm. sure, but uh, as far as the terracotta repairs, it wasn't all. So there are probably a handful, um, maybe a dozen, I'm not sure exactly, of guys that were doing the actual uh, terracotta sculpting and such. Yeah, and a lot of people remember that that old fountain sign from yeah. from the photographs. Um, is, people have asked, you know, is there a reason why they didn't recreate that? Was it just cost or or just wanting to change the identity? I don't know. I you'd have to talk to the architect. I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and several people have asked, are we going to have follow up programs to this? And we really would like to do that. So I encourage everybody to keep an eye out uh, for more programs. Well, and um, it's fun to go check it out at night too because all this. All this and all this all light up. And there's lights strung through here. It's very, just beautiful. Uh, yeah, we're just about out of time. Just, so just a couple of other questions. It sounds like you used a lot of stainless steel this mm -hmm. time to keep some of the metal Absolutely. brackets and other pieces from corroding. Is that, is that right? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, and let me just look and see if we've got any other questions we can answer. Um, was the damage mostly just part of the natural aging process? It's not like there was an inferior material or any problems with the original construction? Well, I talked a little bit about there may have been some issues with the glaze in the third period of construction, but it, for the most part, it was the, the natural, just the age of it. Like yeah. anything, it has to be taken care of. So if now that it is in a position where the owner can take care of it on a regular basis, the important thing is keeping those glaze falls to a minimum so that water can't get into the pieces and cause more glaze pops. Okay. Well, I know we didn't get to all of the questions and I apologize for that. We had some wonderful uh, questions, uh, but this is also being recorded and uh, everybody's gonna get a link to it and please share it with other people who will be interested. And um, thank you so much, Emily, for your time and sharing all this uh, fascinating information with us. And uh, we hope you'll join us for other Preserving Historic Places workshops and virtual programs in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone.